All right, good morning, everybody. You know, so I want to start getting, good morning, my name is Michael Carducci. How many people saw me last year? Oh, awesome, wonderful, thank you. Thank you, one person applauding. I will say one thing, as a speaker, as an entertainer, doing all the various things that I do, I've learned that there is nothing more disconcerting than the sound of one person clapping. So my rule, just, just to set expectations, is uh, all together or not at all. Sound fair? Oh, hey, oh. And so it's all together. I love it. Well, I'm going to explain. Hopefully this will all make sense as we go. But before I do, I just want to show you something. Something that I've observed over the years that in general, people are just very bad at. Now, Brian, I'm going to throw this paper ball to you, but that's not a very random selection, isn't it? I threw it directly to you. So why don't you throw it over your shoulder? And uh, perfect. Nice catch. Do me a favor. You don't have to do much. In a moment, you're going to call out a random number. This is one of the things that I've learned, though, that people are really bad at. And what's interesting is I'm going to be able to tell you that people are really bad at this. I'm going to tell you why people are really bad at this. And I guarantee you, and I don't even think we've met yet, that you are still going to be very bad at this. Now, don't take this too personally because it's something that nobody is very good at. And this is why this is a problem. This is why that we're talking about this. I learned over the years that if you ask a person to give you a random number, a random digit from zero to nine, the results, the results aren't really all of that random. In fact, and by the way, I'm about to tell you something, and this may or may not affect your decision, but it will, <laughs> but not significantly. This is the distribution of random numbers you get from people. I asked 100 people to give me a random number. Notice that they all disproportionately like the numbers seven and three. Do you know why? Because those numbers feel random. Not because they are random, but because they feel random. If we go online and we just get actual random numbers, this is what the distribution looks like. But if you ask people for random numbers, this is what the distribution looks like. But here's the thing, now that you know this, and I'm about to ask you again, for a random number, this is what people tend to do. This is a more random distribution. <laughs> Give me a random digit, go. Nine, interesting. One of the not very common ones. Throw it to somebody else. Or to nobody else. <laughs> you don't have to get up. Same deal. Now you can see where people normally go. That might affect your decision, it might not, it will. But give me a random digit. Six. Okay, throw it to somebody else. A lot of, the, a lot of those numbers that aren't very high in the distribution, the ones that feel more random now than seven or three, now that we know that what we know. Of course, I've mentioned this now. What's your number gonna be, sir? Four. Four, all right. And go ahead and throw it one more time. Interesting, interesting you said four. Uh, name a number, one more. Two, interesting you said, interesting. All right, uh, you're way back there. Go ahead and come on down uh, if you would and give him a round of applause as he makes his way down here. Yeah. Now, because I want to ask this question before we go too much too further. And you remember your number, sir? What was your number? Nine? Four and two. Do you believe, knowing everything you know, that those are random numbers? Getting a lot of head shakes. Before we started, on my way in here, in fact, I wrote a prediction down. Now, if I just pulled it out of my pocket, I know I'm dealing with a room full of engineers. You would reasonably conclude Oh, he must have 10,000 different pieces of paper in his pocket to cover all the possible permutations. Actually, there aren't nearly 10,000 permutations. Do you know why? Because humans are really bad at coming up with random numbers. Nobody repeated the digit. Do you know why? Because that doesn't feel very random. Nobody picked seven or three. Do you know why? Because those don't feel very random. The numbers that I predicted are actually pinned to the center of my back, completely out of my reach. Sir, come on down, please. And verify, that is safety pin to the back of my jacket. 
Unpin that, please. Now, in a loud, clear voice, what was your digit, sir? What was the first digit? Out loud, loud. Nine. Nine. Thank you. We have a second digit. Out loud. Out loud. Six. Thank you. Two for two. That wasn't very random at all. Now, here's where it gets a little bit tricky. Your number was? Four. Four. Your number was? Two. I got those flipped. Yeah. I cannot believe it. So what are the last two digits? Two, four. Two, four, not four, two. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, I'm keeping an eye on both of you. So I got four for four, and almost all of them, in the, at least half of them in the right order, but I got four for four. That's crazy. And it tells us something really important, that random numbers, all of these things, these are things that we're just bad at. And I observed this phenomenon a long time ago when I was much younger as a, as a working magician. I observed this phenomenon because I used to ask people, as a magician, I'm going to go grab some things over here. I'll come right back and frame, I promise. I used to just ask people when I had a deck of cards, this is how I'd open certain magic tricks. And I would say to people, stay. <laughs> there we go. Now we're warmed up. Now that we're warmed up, we can get fancy. Ooh. Almost warmed up. I'm not a morning person. I don't know about the rest of you. I'm a firm believer, by the way, and Soren can attest to this, that there should not be two 8 o'clocks in a day. Unless it's the English 8 o'clock, then it's okay. <laughs> but it started out as a working magician years and years ago. I'm going to tell you this story. I would ask people to give me a random number, a random card. And it was amazing. Disproportionately, the most common cards were the Ace of Spades, the Queen of Hearts, and a few other common cards, sevens and threes, in fact. And I'm curious, Rene, in Germany, is the Ace of Spades still the most commonly named card? What is the most, uh, that's interesting, I didn't know this is cultural. Uh, what's the most commonly named card in Germany? Okay, queens and seven. By the way, for those who don't know, Rene is a German magician who is here on an exchange program. <laughs> but seven of diamonds, where's my seven of diamonds? Oh, seven of hearts. You can see there's a, there's a big spike right over here with the seven of hearts. There's the queen of hearts. In the U.S., the ace of spades is number one. Queen of hearts is number two. And it's interesting. And again, everybody feels like these are random numbers but they, or random cards, and they really, really aren't. And the result, the thing that, that one of the things that we have to take away from this is that random numbers aren't always that random. And although that's fine and that's entertaining from a magic perspective, it is... Um, it is also important from a security perspective, and we're going to talk all about this. But, you know, I lie for a living. Let's be honest. You know, people ask me what I do for a living. I could say I'm a magician, I'm a sleight of hand artist, I drop cards in front of large crowds of people. I don't know how you want to describe it, but uh, one of my favorite ways to describe this is that uh, I'm a professional liar. I lie for a living. This is what I do. People hire me, and I come in and say, I'm going to deceive you, and then I deceive them. And I, in that regard, I don't feel so bad about it because, you know, I could be a liar, but at least I'm an honest liar. And Soren, I'm going to pick on you for a moment. Is that okay? Can I bring you up? Everybody give him a round of applause. I found this, by the way, oh, awesome. at the 7-Eleven. I'm going to share a Coke with Soren. <laughs> and so I have to do this with you. Now, so you were here last year. You saw some of the magic. Yes. Have, you, have you learned any magic tricks in the intervening time? Unfortunately not. You've been a busy man, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> but that's okay, because I've got you. I'm going to teach you a magic trick right now. Sound good? Yeah. Definitely. You like Coca-Cola, right? Yes. Well, this is one to share with Soren. And I'm glad you got a sugar-free one. That's right. You and me both. <laughs> got to watch those carbs. Here, let me actually give you this. There you go, hold that up, like you're toasting the audience. <laughs> and I'm going to do the same thing. It's, it's a little warm, I apologize. Okay, now I'm going to teach you this magic trick. And if this goes well, they're going to be stunned, and they're going to give you a huge round of applause. I like that. Wait for it, he's got to pull it off first. 
but I appreciate your enthusiasm. So you're gonna hold it up as though you're toasting the audience. Now there are two parts to any magic trick. There's the incantation and the denouement. Watch me, I will show you. First, incantation. You start this direction. Cup above your head. Close your eyes. No, not yet, you're watching me. If you miss this, this might go wrong and I don't want this to go wrong. Okay, so, so watch me, close your eyes, and it is exactly 12 steps counterclockwise or anti-clockwise, I guess. Close your eyes. 12 steps. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, Right? Does that make sense so far? Yes. Okay. We'll just break in the stages. I'm going to go easy on you. So, it's your turn. Above your head, close your eyes. 12 steps counterclockwise. You did. That's okay. It'll probably still work. If it doesn't, though, it's your fault. <clears throat> I want to point this out. <laughs> and now, watch carefully, and then immediately repeat what I do. If you wait, it's not going to work. Are you ready? Yeah. The denouement. <laughs> <laughs> right above your head. Yay! Give him a round of applause. <laughs> Woo! So this is my point, though. Yes, I'm a liar. But in the words of the late, great Ricky Jay, at least I'm an honest liar. So this is really kind of the origin of all of this, being a professional magician. And I know these seem like fairly orthogonal topics. For those who didn't raise their hands, who weren't here last year, uh, you might be thinking, wait, we're opening a technical conference with a magic show? First of all, why not? I don't know about you, I love magic. But not only that, it, it's, it's surprisingly germane. We talked about this a little bit last year. You know, people ask me, how do you come up with a new magic trick? Well, it's very simple. I think of the most impossible thing that I can imagine, figure out a way to perform it, and then do it. And if you want to contrast this with, oh, I don't know, an average sprint, right? We get ridiculously impossible requirements from the product owner, then we figure out a way to do it, and then we ship it. But, you know, aside from these parallels, and we could go on and on and on about this, aside from these parallels, I wouldn't even be here today if it wasn't for magic. And I'm not just talking about because Soren's like, this guy would be fun to have as a keynote, but I wouldn't even be in this industry. So I got my big break in show business several years ago, 20-something years ago, as the house magician at TGI Fridays, because dreams really do come true. And I don't know if you know this or not, but it turns out the house magician at TGI Fridays doesn't make a lot of money. <laughs> In fact, there's a joke. What's the difference between a pizza and a magician? A pizza can feed a family. <laughs> and it's funny because it's true, fortunately. <laughs> but uh, I, was, I was enjoying my time as the house magician going table to table and showing magic to guests. And I'll never forget this. I realized one day very quickly that magic was not going to get me into the lifestyle to which I would like to become accustomed. And I realized one day, to the delight of my parents, by the way, that I needed a real job. I had a conversation. I think I'd moved out at this point, and I have no idea how I was paying rent as a restaurant magician, because it turns out, at the time, a restaurant magician makes exactly the same amount of money as a busboy, except without as many tips. But that's also because I wasn't that good yet. <laughs> or, or still, who knows. But I said to my mother, I said, I need a real job. And she says, you know, because she knew I was passionate about computers and programming. I have been all my life. I taught myself to program, I think I was eight years old on an Apple II. Anybody else? AppleSoft Basic? All right. Couple other old people, not just me. The young people's like an Apple too. Is that, is that like an iPad? Yeah. But she said, you know, if you wanted to get a job as a, as a developer, if you wanted to get an internship or anything like that, there's a man who attends my church. 
that you should meet. And she gave me the man's information. His name was Martin Anderson, and I did a search online. Now, this is pre-Google. This was quite a while ago. I think I looked him up on Lycos or Alta Vista. Okay. Yeah. All right. Just feeling where I'm at. <laughs> I'm among some of my people. I like it. Uh, I looked him up on Lycos or Excite or Alta Vista or wherever, and I found his company website. And he had a small software development practice. It looked uh, pretty thriving. It looked like a, a nice shop and be a great opportunity to go work there for a little while. And so I keep reading. I read all about his company. And then somehow I stumbled onto a corner of the web that was his personal homepage. Remember that in the 90s when we all had homepages? I found his homepage, and it had his whole life story, all about his family, all about his, how he met his wife, his company, his background, his education. He just kind of, yeah, that's what we used to do, write our little About Me page. And, you know, pre-MySpace and all that. And I read all about his family. And as fate would have it, that very Sunday, I'm back at TGI Fridays. And I'm going table to table. And this was my introduction. And I'm not proud of this. I walked up to a table and I said, hello, my name is Michael. I'm the wandering magician. I was wondering if you'd like to see a little bit of magic. Yeah, people laughed. It took me years to realize that not all laughs are good laughs. <laughs> I used to argue with people, no, no, that's a great line. It gets a laugh every time. And I says, yeah, at you. But I walked up and I said, I was wondering if you'd like to see some magic. And he says, well, good afternoon, Michael. My name is Martin. This is my wife, Grace, my daughter, Hannah, my daughter, Vanessa, my son, Jason, and my son, Michael. That was the guy. A guy, I should point out, who I spent the night before reading his entire life story. Now, I don't want to give away the secrets to magic, but I'm going to give you away one of the secrets to magic. We take advantage of every single vulnerability, every available exploit that we have at our disposal. If somebody's going to read your mind or influence you to call out a particular number, I'm not really controlling you at all magically. You, I'm just using my five senses to create the illusion of a six. This is the best definition I've found for this field of magic called mentalism, when you're supposedly reading people's mind or controlling them psychically or whatever else. So I go into my set, and halfway through, he says something. And I said... Spoken like a true engineer. And he says, what? I said, I bet you studied natural sciences somewhere like Oxford or Cambridge. And you can see his eyes get big for just a second. For just a second. Because here's the reality. When you're doing magic for engineers, their reactions are different to literally everybody else's. If you ever watch TV and you see a TV magician go and do a card trick or something, and people scream and they run around and they do all this stuff, that actually happens sometimes, and it's great. When you do magic for an engineer, the best you can possibly hope for is this. And then they start probing. So I say, spoken like a true engineer, I bet you studied natural sciences at Oxford or Cambridge. And he says, wait, which one? And I said, which university? He says, yes. I know. You're an Oxford man through and through. He says, well done. Wait, what did I study? I said science is, yeah, but specifically. Something on the pure end of the spectrum. So not like psychology or botany or, he says, I said something more like chemistry or physics. I think you studied physics at Oxford and I think you have a master's. And he's, ooh, well done. And then his wife chimes in and she said, you're very observant. And I said, Grace, your accent. And she says, yes, I said, you're from the Philippines. She says, very good, but specifically, <laughs> I, you're not from Manila. She says, no. I said, I think you're from maybe a little further, Davos City? And she says, 
you have a good year. And this continues. This continues, by the way, for about 45 minutes. Do you know why? Because I wanted to reveal every little detail that I possibly could, everything I had read on that website. And uh, meanwhile, the food had come, it had gotten cold, and they were, forget it, this guy, and they're watching me, and he is probing, Martin is probing, trying to find a weakness in all of my armor. And uh, I just reveal detail after detail after detail. Somehow, magically, this man just shows up and knows everything about him. This is the greatest magician he's ever seen. And then I drop the bomb. I say, by the way, I should probably let you get some food, eat with your family, but... That and the GM had walked by three times now doing one of these. And uh, I said, I should probably let you eat, but I want to let you know, I'm also a keen amateur programmer. And he says, really? I said, I don't know if you're ever hiring or looking for an intern. And he says to me, if you're half as good at that as you are at this, <laughs> you're hired. <laughs> And that was how I got my first job. I was literally hired on the spot at TGI Fridays because of magic. I wish I could say that I had gotten smarter over the years, but I feel like I've bluffed my way into that job, and I've bluffed my way into this conference, but I hope, if nothing else, you're entertained and you still learn a few things. But, uh, by the way, I want to point this out. So Martin, Martin Anderson, is still a very good friend of mine. This was 20 years ago. Still a very good friend of mine, and he doesn't know this story. <laughs> so if you're putting this online, just let you know. So we've discovered a problem. Let's find a solution. Find a solution. Now, as uh, software developers, when we, uh, when we have a problem, what's something we do? We throw technology at the solution. So let's throw some technology. We'll go. That, was a, that used to be a nice die. We'll go low tech. Low tech is still tech. So do me a favor, throw that to somebody, maybe off to the side there or off to the side there. Uh, just so that way we don't have to go too far up there. And uh, I'm not going to throw this. I'm going to pass this. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is a slightly heavy block of wood. So. Tell you what, I'm going to pass this to you if you want to pass that back. By the way, you can check that out. It's a largely fair die. I mean, I haven't weighed it or anything, and I also dropped it just now, which is going to affect the geometry of it just a little bit. Um, but uh, do you like that? Who, who got it? Who's got the paper? Okay, you got the die. There you go. Awesome. Now, let's do something a little bit different here because... Uh, because asking people to come up with a random number, people aren't that good at this. So we're going to throw some technology at it. I didn't know it was that good. The guy literally fell out of his chair. <laughs> I haven't even gotten to the magic yet. So uh, instead of selecting a number, why don't you, yeah, I mean, you can select a number if you want, or you can roll it on the floor, whatever it is you want to do. And you've got a number, and by the way, it's down there, I can't see it. There's no way I could possibly know. And you rolled it, but you want to roll it a couple times and make sure that you're happy that that's, uh, you're good? Okay. Because uh, if you choose a number, you know, you're going to bias yourself, whether you mean to or not. Whereas if you roll it, you've got a truly random number. And then that way, the only way that I could possibly get it is to, uh, to guess. And I would have a one in six chance now instead of pretty much a one in one chance. No offense, but when you were picking a number. Or a one in two chance with, with you guys up there because you're a little trickier. You probably got up earlier than I did. I understand. So I'd have a one in, one in six chance. By the way, it wasn't four, was it? Good. So then our function is wrong. By the way, do you like that, uh, do you like that die? That was, uh, I made that in uh, sixth grade in shop class. It was, it was originally supposed to be a gift for my mother. Somehow I ended up with it. But uh, whatever, I'm not bitter. I also uh, made my mother a cutting board in, in that same class, that same year. Somehow it ended up in my kitchen. But uh, whatever, I'm not bitter. 
So, so we could do this. We, we could do this, and, and now at this point, I would have to guess, and I'd have to guess up to three times to even have a 50-50 chance of getting it right. But the reason I bring all of this up is because these are things that we're simply not thinking about. There are things that we're just bad at as software engineers, and there are things that we're just bad at as human beings, and this is not an indictment or a criticism of anybody here. It's, it's th these are simply things that we don't think about. And the, um, the problem with random numbers, they seem like a pretty in insignificant thing. And it's hard for us as human beings to come up with random numbers. It's also hard for us as human beings to write code that generates random numbers. And there have been multiple revelations over the last several years now that, uh, that are unauditable sources of random numbers where we have no idea where these come from or how they come from, uh, there's been revelations that nation states, governments, and other organizations have been putting pressure on chip manufacturers, on Linux kernel hackers to start weakening the foundation of all the cryptography that we deal with. This is a fundamental flaw in human psychology and human reasoning that people believe that somehow we can create a backdoor, we can create a vulnerability that only the good guys will use. And it simply does not work like this, and we, we, we learn this lesson, it seems, over and over and over and over again. We never really think about the threats, first of all. We don't, we simply don't. Um, we're not aware of the vulnerabilities that exist in every single system that, that, that we're working with. And we also don't think about the exploits as well. Now, magicians, this is, being a magician has given me a slightly unique perspective. Because to be honest, magicians exploit human beings and human nature for a living. This is what we do. We, we find, you know, basically, but it's for fun and profit rather than for Malice and profit, I guess. I guess a lot of this, there's still that profit motive for a lot of attackers and hackers and everything else. But um, it reminds me of these things that I've learned over the years, how, how our perception ultimately is flawed. And Brian, do you, you're right up here. Do you mind if I pick on you? Can you come on down? Can everybody give him a round of applause? <laughs> Misdirection. You're familiar with that term, right? Yes. Misdirection, for anybody who isn't, it's a technique magicians use to redirect your attention in one place so you're not paying attention to what we're actually doing elsewhere. Quick demonstration. Come right over here. This way I think everybody can see. And before I begin, they're all there and they're all different, right? Are we over there? No, some of them are over there. <laughs> that was a test. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Brian, just reach out, grab any card. Have a look at it, show it around, it doesn't matter if I see it, it's not that kind of trick. But so we know there is no shenanigans. I want you to sign that. That way uh, you won't think that I'm cheating. Of course I will be cheating, I just don't want him to think that I'm cheating, if that makes sense. Sign it, show it to them, show it to me if you want. And your job, very simply, put that in the middle, your job, very simply, is to follow the card. You're paying attention, right? Okay, we'll slow it down. It's, it's, it, yeah. Uh, yeah. Before we begin, we'll start simple. Before I do anything tricky, because there's a little bit of trickery right there. Before we do anything tricky, where's your card right now? I would, I would like to say no. there, but... <laughs> okay, you gotta watch. That's all right. We'll do this, and we'll switch it back, because I did switch it. That's what the switch looked like. Okay, here we go. Watch. Do not lose this card. In fact, we know that's your card because you signed it. And I'll let you push that in. Don't take your eyes off of it. Go ahead and push it in. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Let's do this under test conditions because obviously if you give me the card and we put it in there somewhere, I'm gonna do some kind of trickery to keep track of it. So, instead of me pushing the card in, 
I'll let you do it. So we can see exactly where it is. You can see that? Yes? With the writing? Take the cards. The cards. You can see it in there? Push it all the way in. Turn them face down. Mix them up. I'll turn my back. This is fair, right? This is fair. Not only has he got complete control, he can focus on the security of that card. He knows it's in there. He knows it's lost. Would you agree at this point that it is well and truly lost in the deck? Did you give him a cut? That's okay. I gave him a cut for you. But would you agree at this point that you've, you've pushed it in there, you've mixed them all up, that it is well and truly lost in this deck? I'm going to give him a little more control, a little more security. Hold your hand out. Put your other hand on top of the deck. Nothing. How long should it take me to find the card under these circumstances? Where he pushed it in, he mixed it up. You never lost control of that card. Yes? How long? Roughly. Seconds. 30. 30 seconds. Does your watch have a second hand? Go ahead and check. Give him a round of applause. That's for you. I learned a really important lesson doing magic and also writing code. That the closer we watch, the more we miss. The more we focus on one thing, the more we're focusing away on other things. This is, this is a big challenge because one of the things we don't realize as human beings, not as engineers, but as human beings, is that our attention is single-threaded. So all it takes is a question, eye contact, setting the pen down, and all of a sudden, in, in almost no time at all, one card changes into another card, or disappears entirely, or goes into my pocket, or under my mouth, or under your watch. And... All we have to do is focus on one thing to miss everything else. And this is one of the reasons, by the way, that I do love doing magic for engineers, because they watch closer than most people. And they start taking it really seriously at some point. They're watching the car. And that's actually one of the most satisfying moments of my life. When we're doing the thing where the car ends up in my mouth, and they're like this. In fact, they're kind of like this. I, I, I was fortunate I got to do this at uh, GreatConf a while back. And I don't know if we have... Uh, any video controls or not. But, and this is Jen from OCI, by the way. We've got some Grails rock stars in the background. But uh, we did the same thing where she's watching the card. And I love when they just keep staring. They're like, I'm not taking my eyes off of this. I'm not taking my eyes off of this. No, I'm not going to look up. I'm watching you. You know, one of the things, one of the things I love is, is, is misdirection. It's just, it's, it's so satisfying. It's so much fun. But it, it reminds me of just all of these little things that, we, we, that, 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 that fail us and we don't even notice it. Like, I have this image of a watch on here right now because this reminds me that we can't even trust what we see. We can't even trust our own eyes. How many people remember the old analog watches? Okay, oh, you've still got one. Have you ever had this experience, or anybody here, where you've looked down at your watch, and for just a moment, you had this like nagging fear that your watch had stopped? And then after what seems to have been more than a second, it starts ticking again. Okay, I see a few people nodding, a few people, you're nodding. Do you know why that is? That baffled me for years, and I, I just, every now and again, I'll wake up in the middle of the night and wonder, it is because our brains know that, this, that if you're moving your eyes from here to here, that you're not actually interested at all in any of the intervening scenery. Your eyes literally just shut off because your brain knows, I don't need to process that. I don't need to process that, that visual input. Your eyes literally just shut off until you get to here, and then they turn back on. Now, we don't perceive that because our brain also lies to us. Our brain warps our perception of time to backfill that blank spot. And that's why when you look down at your watch, it feels like it sits on that number for more than a second because our brain is literally warping our perception of time. And I talk about misdirection 
Because this is actually a crucial thing for us to understand as software engineers, that, that security requires focus and broader focus, not narrower focus. And that's a, that's a challenging thing. Because, you know, I learned about misdirection. One of, the, one of the most interesting applications of this is pickpockets. And if you've ever been to Spain, you've probably had something happen. I, in fact, I, I read a, a, a story recently about a speaker at a conference in Spain about a month ago had his backpack stolen that had his laptop, all his presentation materials, his passport, his wallet, everything. Stolen in Barcelona. And, um, and pickpocketing is really interesting in how it works because pickpockets manipulate that single threaded nature of your attention. And it's fascinating all the different techniques they use. I mean, it's a really interesting case study. For example, you're walking down a narrow street and there's a crowd of people and they're walking very slowly in front of you. And this starts to frustrate you, you know, because you can't go around and they're going slow and they're kind of obnoxious and you're, come on, and then somebody bumps into you and now you're like, come on, hey, they're, you know. They are all, everybody standing around you in that, in that moment is part of the pickpocketing team. Distracting you, bumping into you. Your focus is on the people, the annoying people that are walking slow. Or when somebody bumps into you, it's overwhelming your sensory input, so you feel somebody bumping into you, but maybe not that wallet sliding out of your pocket. And we're so predictable that we advertise exactly where our valuables are. Did you know this? Pickpockets know exactly in which pocket your valuables are, because humans are extraordinarily predictable. It's not just magicians who exploit this. Have you ever seen these signs in metro areas in different European cities? Do you know who puts those signs up? The pickpockets. Do you know why? Because you see that and say, oh my, still got my wallet. <laughs> and they just sit on the bench and they watch. Back right pocket, inside jacket pocket. We just do this. We might as well get a giant neon sign. Now, let me ask you a question before we go any further and talk about these things. In this room, how many people have security as like a, like a core part of your job function? One, two, or okay, one, one and a half, two, three, out of, well, this entire room. One, one and a half, two, three. That's it? That's it? No? Nobody else? Nobody else? Literally, that is part of every single one of our jobs. The software we, we write, we have to think about the security of it. This is literally every single person here's responsibility. Let me tell you why. I write a line of code, and I say, okay, well, we need to look up a username. I've got the Pojo come in and my controller, and then right in there, because I'm a terrible developer, right in the controller, I construct a SQL string. Select star from users, where username equals string interpolation and password equals string interpolation, go. Guess what? That works. <laughs> and if it's up to the, the, the business people, they're going to say, yep, that works, ship it. Now, we don't do that, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Gosh, I remember when I was a bad developer. I mean, sorry. I remember when I was a worse developer than I am today because I wrote some software. By the way, this was used by the, the accounting department. Yeah, probably fine. And they, hi they let me build this system. And so I go and do this, and uh, they enter somebody's account in there, and they were Irish. Their last name was O'Reilly. And they said, the application is crashing. And I said, oh, yeah, whenever somebody has an apostrophe in their name, just put two apostrophes, apostrophes in there, and it'll be fine. And they're like, oh, great, thanks. And it's fine. And I'm like, this is totally fine. Now, this wasn't even the worst thing. I worked with somebody... And, and, and this was back in the same job, the same, about 20 years ago, and I'm in this company, and we had an intern. And they thought I should be doing the code review. 
And I'm the person who's like at least looking my username and password up in the database. And I'm using the Blowfish algorithm to encrypt my passwords because it's more secure than some of the other ones, than DES, right? Because I'm smart. And uh, they, they say, review this code, and I look at it. And in the login form, there's code. It says, if username equals X and password equals Y, then is authenticated equals true. Else if username equals Z and password equals A, then is authentic. And there was 25 else ifs in that block with every username and password combination. It worked. It met all the functional requirements. Ship it. Now, at least I had some insight on that and asked the question, what happens if somebody needs to change their password? And, my, uh, and, the, and the intern's answer was, well, we just release a new build of the application. <laughs> and we just deploy that out. I'm like, I don't think we can control where these binaries live. It could be on a floppy drive. It could be, it was a long time ago. It could be, you know, on a network share. It could be anywhere. And this is one of the fundamental things that, that, that we all need to take upon us. One, that security is our responsibility. It might be a joint responsibility. It might be a shared responsibility. But it's one that we still carry. And two, we have to think about not just the use cases, we need to be thinking about the abuse cases as well. Because if there's one thing that I've learned from misdirection and magic and everything else, if we're focused over here, then we're missing everything around us. And again, this is just a universal flaw that we all have. It, the more we focus on this, the more we miss literally everywhere else around us. You're watching the cards, not your watch. You're watching the deck and not my hands. Or watching my hands, but not wherever else. And this is why as magicians, we can even tell you exactly what we're going to do and still get away with it. One of my favorite things I like to do with that trick where the card ends up in my mouth is literally tell people, this card is going to end up in my mouth. And they're like, oh, no, it's not. <laughs> One of my favorite things that I like to do to uh, engineers as well is, uh, is destroy little challenges. I said, this is going to happen so fast that the human eye can't follow it. And their reaction is, you want to bet? And we like to think that we have perfect 4K, high-definition visibility in our periphery. We don't. We have nice high-def right here, and everything else is like a bad late 90s cell phone camera. I mean, you, you could kinda, you're kind of aware of what it's a picture of, but that's about it. So the first thing we have to do is care. One of the first things we have to do is accept that this is part of our responsibility. And then we need to step outside of the functional requirements, the use cases, and start thinking about the abuse cases. Now, we, none of us, I hope, write SQL injection vulnerabilities, right? We, we, we know not to do that. But that's not enough, and it's funny just watching that as an example, as a little microcosm evolve over time because it used to be that we would just strip out apostrophes. And the thing is, that, that seems like it would satisfy the security requirements, but people are always looking for new ways, new exploits, new vulnerabilities to exploit. And it uh, turns out Unicode apostrophes could surprise us from time to time. We could drop in different Unicode characters and still have an injection vulnerability. You know, this is one of the biggest flaws that we have from a security perspective is we just assume when things are working that they're working as they should. We, we trust too much and question too little. I, I love how some of the greatest security breaches in history were as a result of everything working and doing exactly what it was supposed to do. But nobody asked the question, is it doing anything that it shouldn't be possible to do? There's a great story that happened years ago it was a Wired journalist, a journalist for, the, for Wired magazine. One day, goes to uh, access his laptop, and the laptop shows a gray screen, 
asking for a security code. He thinks, well, that's weird. I'll check in with my iCloud account. Opens the iPod, or the iPad, and the iPad's blacked out too. Pulls out the phone, the phone's not working. It takes hours on the, on the support line for Apple, talking to different people, before he finally realizes what's happened. All of his accounts were compromised, and as soon as the, as soon as the iCloud account got compromised, all of his devices got locked out and remote wiped. By the way, each one backed up to the other, so everything was gone. The iPad backs up to the laptop, and the laptop, uh, you know, there's certain stuff on the iPhone, all of it got wiped out. Two years, his first two years of photos, first two years of his son's life, all of the photos were gone, for example. Just all of this stuff gone, no backups, no way to retrieve it. And he finally pieces together what's happened. This was just a ploy to get access to his Twitter handle. It was, a, it was what they call an OG social media handle, a three-character Twitter handle, one of the early, early adopters. That's all they wanted was a three-character Twitter handle. And so they did this by compromising the Gmail account by compromising the iCloud account, by compromising the Amazon account. Here's the whole chain. Everything worked exactly the way it was supposed to. The attacker calls an automated service for Amazon.com. On this service, he's able to quickly figure out which email address is the account address for Amazon because Amazon told him, this, gave them this feedback. We don't recognize this email address. We don't recognize this email address. Oh, wait, here it is. And then he, through that automated system, adds a credit card. Now, this isn't a valid credit card, but it's a credit card that will pass a checksum. Just generates a number, plugs it in, hangs up the call, calls back to Amazon now, gets a representative, and said, I can't access my account. Here's my username. How can we reset this? Well, I can't give them my password either. Uh, is there any, way, any other way we can identify me? And they say, can you tell us one of the credit card numbers on your account? Why, yes, I can. Here it is. And they say, perfect. That's definitely you. Here's a new password. And now he's in. Next, calls up Apple and says, I can't access my iCloud account. And they said, well, how do we know it's you? He says, can you verify me with one of my billing credit cards? And they said, yes, we need the last four of your billing credit cards. See, they're being secure. Because the rest of it is sensitive information, but the last four is not sensitive. Which is why Amazon shows you the last four of every credit card on your profile. And so he says, well, I can't remember which one it is, so let me give you a couple. First one, no. Second one, no. Third one, that's it. Thank you. Glad now that we've identified you, we'll reset your iCloud. Then he goes to Google and says, I can't access my Google account. Well, we'll send an email to your recovery account, which is the iCloud account. And now he's got Google, he's got iCloud, he's got Amazon, and he's got Twitter. Reset my password, done. Oh, and wipe everything out for good measure. The problem is every single system did exactly what it was supposed to do, and we weren't, the people who designed these systems weren't thinking about the abuse cases. Now, how do we do this? Certainly, experience, code reviews, these are great tools, but we've all worked in that echo chamber where there are just weird things that go on in an environment, and when you've worked in dysfunctional environments long enough, you kind of get used to the smell. I worked for a company once, we had 12 developers, and I just joined. And I built something. And they said, well, give it a code review with Jim, our senior engineer. And so I get on a call with Jim. And we start, we op open the IDE, we start doing a code review. And he says to me, before we even get into the code, he just looks at the source tree and said, why are there so many class files? And I said, it's object-oriented code. And he says, oh, you're one of those. He says he likes his code to read like a novel. You start at the beginning and you go all the way to the end. And I'm like, that's cool. <laughs> I don't. But we'll just agree to disagree. You know, you've got to pick your battles, right? 
And so we're going through this, and uh, finally he's done with the code review and spied from the, the, the lasagna code. I'm like, lasagna code? He's like, yeah, too many layers. I'm like, oh, you like spaghetti more than lasagna. I understand. <laughs> Four layers is not too many, by the way. If you've got a repository and a service and whatever. Anyway, um, we get through. He says, okay, I guess, it's, I guess it'll work. And I said, cool, where do I commit? He says, yeah, you've delivered on your commitments. And I said, no, I, I want to check it in. And he says, yeah, yeah, I checked it out, it's good. I'm like, no. I would like to place my source code into your source code repository. How might I do that? Oh, just zip it up and send it to me. Jim was source control. This was like 2010, by the way. This is not acceptable in 1990. This was 2010. There were 12 developers every night would zip up their source tree, send it to Jim, and Jim would just throw it in a pile. No wonder they never did a single build in six months. How the heck do you do that? But you just get used to these things. You get used to the way things are. You get used to the smell. So this is why it's incumbent on us to, one, take ownership for security. Two, start learning about it. This is one of the great things about coming to a conference like this is because you're no longer stymied by the unknown unknowns. You can come here and discover the unknown unknowns. That's the problem with trying to do everything solo from a book or from a YouTube or a Udemy or whatever, that it, you're only really good at Googling for the things that you know that you don't know. But you can't just go on Google or Bing or whatever and say, what don't I know? That's why I like these events. And that's why I'm very grateful to the hardworking folks who are putting this together. By the way, I'm a little sad that the orange suits didn't make an appearance this year. I was ready to get me one of those. I was like, this is a nice look. I, it would have just been me. I would have been awkward, though. And I'm like, this is what I get for showing up late. So, you know, this is why I appreciate the hardworking people who put this event every single year and everybody here who supports it. So I want to thank you for, for that. I want to thank you for your support for this actually incredible developer community as well. And I hope that you learn some unknown unknowns as you go. But there are other resources out there. Uh, one of my favorites is the OWASP project. The OWASP is, is a tremendous resource to help us identify those unknown unknowns. They have top 10 exploits, top 10 vulnerabilities, uh, cookbooks, code samples, sample apps, tutorials, checklists. Just a great resource to run through your code and run through your way of thinking. Is it not only clean, is it also secure? Threat modeling is a useful exercise. My favorite exercise, by the way, if you want to test the security of your application, is to actually attack it. Red team exercises are a lot of fun. Has anybody actually ever done this, a red team exercise in your organization? Anybody? One person, two people, okay. They're a lot of fun. Basically, the idea is a few of you become the red team. You become the attackers, and you try to penetrate your system. And I proposed this at a company I worked for. And you could tell that there's a problem here when the product owner says, I don't think we should allow this. And I said, why not? He said, because you have access to the source, control, the source code, which means you know where the vulnerabilities are. I said, then we better identify those. He says, no, it's, but, but an attacker wouldn't necessarily have that. And I said, are you sure? He says, yes. And I said, by the way, to an operations person in the room. I noticed that your Git workflow is part of your deployment process. And you're just literally doing a Git checkout on the server? I said, cool, that's fine. That makes sense. Are you protecting your .git folder? They said, what? I said, you know, there's a lot of metadata in there you could pull out and you can, you can pretty much get access to the, all the source code on the web server in that .git folder. By the way, I love mentioning this vulnerability in a room full of people because there's usually at least one or two people who are like, 
I'm going to have to write some HT access rules on my Apache server real quick. I don't know. You're probably not running Apache here, though, right? Probably not. But red team exercises where you actually be, try to penetrate the system. And, uh, you know, ideally, the whole security through obscurity thing, we, that shouldn't be an issue. That shouldn't be something that we have to worry about. Now, we've got a couple more things I want to talk about because there, there are a lot of reasons that all of this becomes very, very tricky for, for us as an industry. Not us in this room, but us as an industry. And one of the hardest things is that your security and all of the advice around security is at odds for everything else that everybody is telling us to do. Usability, user experience, right? We want, we want to have a great user experience, build a great user experience, but the problem is we can't do that and keep our code secure. These two goals are at odds, so it has to be a balance. Do you remember that... Uh, Vulnerability we talked about in Amazon when the person called up, plugged in an email address. They said, that's not an email address. Try again. Oh, we don't recognize that one either. Try again. Oh, there we go. That's, that's a big problem. Now, you would think from a usability standpoint, this is exactly what we want to do. If the user is doing something wrong, we need to tell them the way to correct that mistake. That's an invalid username. That's an invalid password. You made this specific mistake. Or this is the specific error message we got. Pass this on to the support team so we can more directly fix the problem. Everything that every piece of information that we volunteer is ammunition for an attacker. And this is why the correct way to do this these days is to say, mm, that didn't work. Either the username or the password is wrong. And that's not what we want to do from a usability standpoint, but it's exactly what we want to do from a security standpoint. And again, these things are at odds. I remember in the early days of PayPal, I used to get really nervous sending money off into the digital ether. That uh, if I was sending some, uh, some money to my, my friend here, I'm not entirely sure how to spell your last name. Chevalier, E-V-E-L-I-E-R. Maybe. I tend to spell it wrong. I have to copy and paste it. But, uh, so I'll type it in, info at renechevalier.de uh, or something like that, and now everybody on, now they're all going to email you uh, if they can spell it right. <laughs> but I would type that in to, the, to PayPal, and in the early days, it would just say, okay, you're sending money to that email address. And I'm just like, I hope I got it right. I'm not just sending my money off into the digital ether, never to be seen again. And then they added a feature where they would actually do a quick user lookup. Isn't that nice? I type in the email address. It's like, oh, you're sending money to Rene. Rene. And uh, here you go. I've got the full name. And it validated it. I'm like, yes, I have the right person. I spelled it right. Send. That sounds like a pretty exploitable API to me start throwing email addresses into it and getting full names back? That's awesome. Now I can just get a random dump of email addresses. I can run it through this API and not only find out who of all these email addresses have PayPal accounts, but also what their names are. Of course, because people are not thinking very well about this, there are probably password leaks as well because in a lot of cases, they're not even encrypting passwords, or they are, but they're, they're, but they're encrypting them and the key can be compromised, or they're hashing them, but they're not salting them, and so on and so on, so on. or we're just all providing bad passwords because this is a problem too. And then they can check out password reuse. Now they know, okay, we've got an email address, let's try their password. And in a lot of cases, because we all use the same password for everything now, now they've got access to the PayPal. But for everybody else, just send an email out. And the email is going to say, Dear Soren, we have some, we've detected some specific activity on your PayPal account, parens, your email address, parens. If this was you, do nothing, and the, trans and the, and the, and the transfers will simply clear in 24 hours. Uh, but if you want to investigate, log in right here. 
And I love that little bold thing. They're like, well, you know, if this is you, just leave it, ignore it. And they're like, wait, no, I don't want to ignore this. And they go in there and try to stop it right away, and they log in. Spear phishing, that's, that's, and that's actually amazing how many of these vulnerabilities, we just kind of trust these things, especially when, coming back to the misdirection, when we're worried about the compromise on the account, that we're not thinking about, wait, is this really PayPal or PayPal P-A-I with an uppercase I that looks like an L or something like that? And we could be anywhere. Same thing happened to a really good friend of mine. Got an email from his attorney and said, um, we've got a couple more documents for you to sign or there's a, you know, there's this, this lawsuit has been filed against you. Um, you know, we're going to investigate it. No charge yet. We're just going to figure out what the deal is with this lawsuit. Uh, I just need you to sign this letter of engagement. And now it's like, what? There's a lawsuit? Oh, my gosh. It's like all the information is in the letter. Okay, click to DocuSign. And it says, we need to verify your identity. Log in with your Google account. Okay. Oh, we're not finding you. Maybe you should log in with your Facebook account. Okay. No, we're still not finding you. Maybe you should log in with your Windows Live account. Okay. No, still not finding you. Huh, maybe you should use your iCloud account. Okay. No, that's not working either. Jeez, what's going on? And hey, we just compromised all of our accounts. It's awesome. It's good stuff. And again, this takes us back to the nature of focus being single-threaded and how it's really easy to distract ourselves, overlook things, and to try to do the right thing and in the process do the wrong thing. So balancing usability and security because sometimes the most helpful thing that we can say is nothing at all, which leads me to one final experiment. And where did I put my little paper ball. Does somebody have it? Is it out there somewhere? Ah, great. We need uh, two people. Throw that, not to me, because I already know, uh, it's going to be really easy for me to read my own mind. That's actually harder than you would think. Throw it to somebody random, I don't mind. All right. Yep, I guess you're up, sir. That was a good shot, by the way. You literally hit him in the head. So come on down, and uh, as you're coming down, I'm going to give him a round of applause. Uh, either way, uh, you're right in the middle, so looks like they want you to go that way. And as you're making your way down, just grab one more person, uh, hand them that, uh, that ball. And I have a book. Do you mind if I borrow that book you're using? Thank you. We're going to talk about informa information leakage. Because, you know, who's got the other ball? Where is it? Come on down, give him a round of applause. <laughs> so I mentioned this in the beginning, talking about magic and mentalism. Magicians use our five senses to create the illusion of a sixth. In other words, we are taking advantage of every single piece of information available to us. Go ahead and hang on to that for a moment. Or I want to hand it to him, I guess. Come right over here. You can stay, oh yeah, you can stay there. Okay, yeah, well, there we go. And come over here, just over the line. Perfect, you're, you're all set, you're all set, okay. Uh, so magicians will, will, will take every little piece of information available to us, bless you. It might be a subtle facial movement. It might be the direction your eyes go when you think. It might just be your body language, your breathing. Or, or if you're not breathing. <laughs> or, actually, as a, as a poker player, one of the biggest tells, one of the biggest pieces of information that, is, uh, that you can read off a person is when they go rigid. Because that's, that tends to indicate a bluff. Because they're very afraid, all of a sudden, of revealing any information that they're bluffing. So they go completely rigid, they don't breathe, they don't move. <laughs> For the first time the entire night, Poker face goes on, and you're like, okay, you're bluffing, I call. So, knowing that, try to give me your poker face. <laughs> here, let's do this. I've got a watch here. Would you do me a favor and just pull the crown on that? Just pop that out. 
There we go. And give it a few twists. Just kind of twist it one way or another because we're going to set it. And I've got it face down this way. I don't actually see what random time you're setting it to. You can twist it as much as possible. But rather than asking him to name a number or name a time, to do this right, I want to give this a truly random time. So you're happy with that? Go ahead and click that back in. And I'm just going to hold this up to you. Do you have the time? You got it? Yeah? And hold your hand out. And just take that right here, here, as fair as possible. So you've got a random time, and we need some random value for you. Take this book, look at it, make sure it looks legit. And we're going to go face down. Now, all the information I need is up here. So I want you to peel back a bunch of pages down there. Yeah, perfect. Just gonna, there we go. Just going to slide it in there. Is that fair? Now we've got, I'm going to just pull this out. Watch me make sure I don't open this book at all. This is why I've got a card there as kind of a bookmark. Because then, now we know the exact page that you selected. I'm going to hold this your way, and I'm just going to peel that page back. So first question, if I do this, can you see the page number? If you look very, very far down the page, can you see the first word on the page? Okay, not Carlo, that's on the top of the page, that's the author, but the actual first word of the paragraph? Okay, you've got it, you've got the page? And would you agree, by the way, that that's fair? Don't forget your page, otherwise this entire effort is going to be for nothing. <laughs> and it'll be a really disappointing and anticlimactic way to end the show. So you know your page, you know your word. Do we need to do this again? <laughs> you got it, okay. And by the way, one more thing, because you're right up here, you're the committee. I looked away when we pulled that back, and I kept everything out of reach. That was test conditions. There's no way I could have seen what you saw. Is that correct? To, to the best of your understanding. Okay. Maybe. I'm going to go with it. He's an engineer. He's hedging his bets. I understand. <laughs> By the way, that's why we're so bad at testing our own code. All right, so you've got a time, you've got a page, and a word. So we've got a bunch of actual random bits of information for me to try to reveal. So poker face, poker face. Starting with you. I have no idea how to pronounce that. What's your first name? Knut. Knut. Okay. Yeah, that wasn't bad. I'm glad I asked. I would have gone K-nut or something. I would, have, I would have gone all American. You know, we're just not good at things. Um, would you consider yourself to be a morning person? Nope. Good answer. I'm not either. This is among friends. What time do you n typically wake? Okay, let me ask you this question. If left to your own devices, you had no children waking you up, no office you had to be at, if you could just wake up naturally, what time would you wake up? Nine? Okay. That's pretty good. I'm a 10.30-ish kind of guy, but I'll go with nine. <laughs> I'm going to guess, by the way, just based on where approximately where, where you stopped to the, the page you picked, where it was, I'm going to guess it was a three-digit number. Is that correct? So it was more than 100. But that's just observation. Now, I could say, I could stand here and say, okay, picture the page number. I see three digits, is that correct? <laughs> Actually, the way a magician would typically do this, if you're curious, is they would say, okay, I guess I'm starting to see a number. Okay, I see, I see two digits clearly. There's not a third, is there? <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> and you're just, you're, you're ev as you go, you're just, you're just, you're, you're, pivoting. You're, you're going through your very elaborate branch of if statements to get to where you want to go. And so I know now, whether you tell me this or not, but I knew that you had a three-digit number. I would have revealed that. So that tells me something. But I can also deduce that it's less than 200, because I know how many pages are in that book. And roughly where you are, it's going to be in the hundreds, in the low hundreds probably, yes? <laughs> Maybe. Yes? Low hundreds? Like 100, 100 something. Starts with the first digits of one, is that right? Do we need to look again? <laughs> Do you know your number? <laughs> okay, we're gonna get a new number. 
Face down. Down here. There we go. I'm trying to time this, by the way. I don't know if you noticed or not. So we go up here. And this is, this is the page that we're going to bookmark right there. I'm going to look away. This time, pay attention. Did I time that well? You remember? Okay, and you got the first word, too? It's down there somewhere. Got it? It's not Carlo. Carlo's the person's name. Take the book. I'll take the, the, our bookmark. All right. Now, I think it's in the low hundreds. Is it in the low hundreds? Okay. You saw a page number. There's three digits. Is the first digit a one? That, okay. We're going to go with that. Back to you, sir. Uh, the time. It's a 12-hour watch. It could be in the morning. It could be in the afternoon. Basically, it's ambiguous. It could be a.m. It could be p.m. But if you were to look at that in your mind, your gut, your initial reaction, is that time shown on the watch a.m. or p.m.? P.m. Okay. This tells me something, by the way. That actually reveals a, sp a piece of information that the time that you set is a low time. Okay, back to you. All right, look at me. Do we need to look again or are you good? Okay, all right. Uh, let's just go, we'll pick the first, we know the first number is a one. Okay, so let's go to the second digit. Okay, I'm just gonna go through zero through nine and every time I say a number, just say no. Ready? Zero. One. You're making this way too easy. He's supposed to say no, he said yes, that's fine. So now I know it's one, one. Okay, I'll tell you what, let's do this one more time. I told you, the leaking information thing, it's, it's easier than you would think. Okay, this time, poker face, this time, say no even if the answer is yes. You're going to lie to me and I'm going to detect when you're lying. Ready? Zero. This is the last digit, by the way. Zero. One. Two. Three. Four. Okay, it's one of those. Zero. No. One. No. Two. Is it a two? It's a two, yes. All right, one, one, two, awesome. Okay, PM. That means that yours is probably before six, before five, maybe before four. I think it's like afternoon, mid-afternoon time. Does that sound about right to you, approximately right, that it's afternoon-ish time if it's a PM? It's not evening, it's not night. Is it, is it afternoon? You can, you can answer this. Yeah, maybe. maybe, okay, I like it. I'm going to go with that. I'm going to take that as a yes, because that was a very affirmative maybe. It wasn't a maybe, it was a maybe. Okay, afternoon. If I'm going to pick an afternoon time, I think one is too early afternoon based on kind of the way I phrased it. So I'm going to go two. No, I'm going to say three. I'm going to say three something in the afternoon. Now look at me. It could be near the top of the hour. It could be near the bottom of the hour. Do you know what I mean by that? It could be closer to the 12 or it could be closer to the 6. Looking at you, I think it's closer to the 6. Specifically, you're looking kind of down here, which tells me it's probably a little bit after the 6. So it's after half past, not quite quarter till. Does that still sound right? Maybe. Maybe. Okay. Here we go. After half past, not quite quarter till. I think it's a little more than closer to quarter till than half past. It could be closer to half past and quarter till. It could be closer to quarter till than half past. I think it's closer to quarter till. I don't think it's quite a quarter till because that would be right in the middle and that would have gotten me a little more of an ambiguous maybe than an affirmative maybe. So I'm going to go. We're just going to pick a number. Right, let's round it down to the nearest five. So instead of quarter till, so we go into blocks of five, 30, 35, 40, 45. It's not 45. It's not 30. It's not 35. Let's say 40. Is it 340? <laughs> is it 340? Is it? is it? I'm saying yes. Will you confirm to them? Thank you. <laughs> now, one, one, two, that's your page. You have a word on that page, and I promise you that I have not memorized every single page in this book. I can promise you that. Although, look at me. Uh, do me a favor, think of the first letter of that word. Can you, can you think of just a letter, the first word, the first letter of that word? The first letter, okay. Picture that letter in your mind. Uh, can, you, can you tell me a planet that starts with that letter? Just out of curiosity. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, maybe in our solar system, let's keep it simple. Maybe, okay, he's looking at me. There's a little bit, okay, he's thinking about this. I think we're in a little bit ambiguous place here now because the answer is yes, but sort of? Be because it's a P. Is it, is, it, is it Pluto? Pluto doesn't really count as a planet, although I'm old school. I think Pluto's still a planet. Who's with me? Thank you. So it's a P. P? Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't mean to step on the applause, but I think we're on a roll here. So P, right there. Uh, last letter. No planets. It's not really. Pending. Pending on page 112. Thank you. Three forty p.m. pending one twelve. One more.
I want to leave you with one thing to think about. More than anything else in my career as a magician, as a professional entertainer, as a software engineer, we don't see the things that we're not looking for. We don't see the things that we're not expecting to see. But sometimes we do fool ourselves and see what we think we're going to see. There is only one watch that is set to 340. That one, which we showed earlier in the slides. That's not set to 340. Take a look. This is a watch where the hands have been removed. And now you have a question that you can probably ask yourself. Did I really see page 112 with the first word on that page being pending? Did you really see that? Because he didn't really see 340. Did you really see that page, that word. Turn to page 112. Because the reality is, if you did see it, <laughs> at what point did I tear that page out and put it into that paper ball? Page 112, and the first word is pending. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Michael Carducci, and it is my distinct pleasure and honor to welcome you to the EU Great Conf 2019. Welcome. Thank you very much. Soren, everybody. Thank you. And uh, I just came up with an idea. Uh, I would like everybody to go out in the atrium uh, for a group photo. And uh, we'll have somebody take our picture, everybody. So just out by the registration table. Thank you.